Well, no, incentive, like an incentive would be like... Hello. Well, you get the digital version of the album. All right, this is going to be a real challenge for me. I don't think I've ever only spoken seven minutes in my life, so we'll see how I can do. This is a presentation that I've given uh, pretty much all over the world, and it's normally about an hour and a half. It's a pretty complex uh, group of things we're going to go over, and I'm going to do my best to truncate it in seven minutes. My name's Brian McLean, and I'm the director of Rapid Prototyping at a company called Leica, which is up in Portland, Oregon. And I don't know if you guys how familiar are with Leica, but Leica, we make stop motion animated films. So today I'm going to be talking about our RP process, which is basically fusing 21st century 3D printing technology with stop motion animation, and particularly replacement animation. So Leica's made three films, first being Coraline, Next was Paranorman, all right, and the third was uh, Box Trolls. All three of these films have been nominated for Best Animated Feature, uh, and they're all done in stop motion animation. Stop motion is as old as film itself. It essentially is an animator manipulating a physical object 24 times every second. So it can take a tremendous amount of time to produce a stop motion animated film. And have you ever wondered what it would be like to be an animator and bringing an inanimate object to life one small movement at a time? I have a small video here with sound to sort of describe a little bit of what, what that would be like. Keeping the streets clean. I don't know if you guys saw how many times the person changed their clothes in that. That represents a day. It takes the average animator uh, about a week working 40 hours to produce just four seconds of film. It takes a tremendous amount of time. So for more than a century, replacement animation, which is what you see here, was done by hand sculpting each individual piece. So primarily what we're looking at here is each of these faces are a slightly different expression and they're being uh, removed and put onto this puppet while the animator is manipulating the body. So as you can see, as you string those, those movements together is where you get subtle animation. Uh, back in 2006, Leica became the first studio to try to take this century old technique of replacement animation and fuse it with 21st century 3D printing technology. So the way that we do that is we use a computer, and we use a program, either Maya, Topogun, ZBrush, or Photoshop, where we are modeling, rigging, animating, and texture painting. But instead of a normal computer animated film where you would render those frames, we actually are taking uh, those, that 3D geometry and we're sending it to a 3D printer. So not only are we creating the, the faces that we're replacing, we're also using the 3D printer to design all of the internal components. So what you see here is what's inside this little character, his name is Eggs, what's inside his head. And all those different colored pieces of plastic represent something that we designed in the computer and then 3D printed out on uh, at various stages of 3D printing. So the audience member never sees any of that. All they see is the face and everything else, or everything else is sort of hidden from them. And that's all there to give the animator the most amount of subtle control over the eyeballs and the eyelids as they're animating the rest of the body. So we will animate the eyebrows in the computer and then we'll animate the mouths. And we'll animate those separately. And we sort of create a collection of poses uh, that we call kits. And then we send those poses and those kits off to the 3D printer. And we're either exporting them in, in WRL file format or STL file format, depending on which type of 3D printer we're going to be sending them to. 
So this is a uh, called a Stratasys uh, Polyjet 3D printer. This is prints in plastic, and we use this to build all those inner components that you see. So here's a time lapse of uh, the 3D printer moving really quickly. Typically, this would take about four or five hours. But essentially, what it's doing is it's laying down liquid resin in very thin layers, and then it's this bright UV light that's curing the layers. And it's it's building up in about four, or excuse me, 16 microns, which is about four times thinner than the average human hair. So it's producing really fine feature detail parts. But as you can see here, there's no color to it, other than just sort of being this monochrome plastic, there's no ability to put color in. So that's why we use this printer to do all the internal components. We use another type of 3D printer, which is um, a 3D system Z-print printer to produce all of the faces. And this is a different type of technology where it's another time lapse here, where what this is doing is it's spraying down a liquid glue or a colored glue onto a very thin layer of powder. And as it's spraying down that glue, the tray drops, and then more powder is dragged over the top. So when these parts come out, they are encased in a powder. So because this technology is, is something that we're sort of harnessing, it was never designed for stop motion animation. It was never designed for animation at all. Uh, we're trying to leverage these two different types of 3D printing technology for our uses. And one of the trickiest things is, is dimensional accuracy and color, basically getting these prototyping machines to print out repeatable geometry. So one of our biggest challenges has been color in general. These, these prototyping machines were designed to print out a shoe that looked cool, but never really matched totally in color. Uh, it didn't really matter because it was just a prototype, and then ultimately that shoe was going to be made out of leather or rubber somewhere else. But what we were doing is trying to use the color printer as our finished product. What you see here are actually color printed faces. So we had a lot of work to do on how do we get the, the color to sync up. So what we were doing is sort of doing it the old school way. I don't know if you guys have seen these. These are sort of like your paint chips that you would see at Home Depot or Lowe's. We literally went through and it's called the Pantone book. And the Pantone book has numbers to it. And we realized if you were to go into Photoshop and select that color, and put it on an object and print it out, you would get something out of the printer that looked like that color. So basically what we did is we went through this Pantone book of 5,000 colors and printed out all these little chips that became sort of our, our guide, our key, that we would then throw away the Pantone book and just look at these little chips. So after, after parts come out of the printer, as I was starting to talk about earlier, they're encased in powder. They need to be completely depowdered, which is what's going on on the screen left. And then they need to be meticulously hand sanded uh, and processed. And look, and every, there's, we have a group of people called our Rapid Prototype Quality Shirts. And they're looking for subtle imperfections or things that the printer may have put in uh, by mistake. So not only are they sanding them, uh, they're looking for color consistency. And after they're sanded, we then take them and drop them in a vat of super glue. And I have another video with sound. You ready? Awesome. So the act, the act of dipping it in super glue is what hardens the part. It sort of sucks into this plaster material, but it also really brings out the color. So the whole interesting thing about um, the powder 3D printer is that. The whole basis behind it is, is a dry powder where you're spraying on a liquid, that liquid's absorbing, then you're taking that thinnest piece and you're dropping into super glue where more liquid is absorbing. So it really depends on a very precise humidity control. And I don't know if you guys know much about Portland, Oregon, but it is rainy as heck up there. Uh, so we have a real hard time trying to control the humidity because we can print one part in the summer and then the exact same file in the winter, and they'll come out a different color and a different shape and a different size. That doesn't work very well for replacement animation. So we built an elaborate database which allows us to not only track uh, the parts, but we're stamping a serial number on each piece that we're then able to see the temperature and humidity at the time of print. Here's a picture of the face library, uh, where all the faces that come out of the printer are processed, and then they're tested and stored. On Coraline, we printed 20,000, Box or Paranorman 40,000, and on recent film, uh, Box Trolls 53,000 faces. 
So we're really taking a prototyping machine and turning it into a mass production machine. So we're in uncharted territory not only for uh, animation, but also for the 3D printing industry. And that's, it's been really interesting as I go around and do these talks, because recently I was introduced at a 3D printing conference as working for the company that was pioneering mass production for 3D printing. And I never really thought about it that way. And if effectively, we are. And the companies who are manufacturing these machines are calling us and saying, hey, have you guys ever seen this? Have you, what's your data tell you about this, this uh, particular problem we're finding? Because we have now almost 10 years of information that we've been collecting about subtle differences in 3D printing. So the faces, and this is a, a shot before it's finished, the faces actually have a seam. We're se separating the brow and the mouth. And that seam is digitally erased in post-production by a team of VFX artists. And those VFX artists also are adding atmosphere, digital crowds, set extensions. Uh, and they've done a wonderful job adding computer elements to our physical uh, environments that we create. So, a typical stop motion film before Leica came around, probably the most famous one was Nightmare Before Christmas. Nightmare Before Christmas, the main character's name is Jack Skellington, and he was done with replacement animation. Jack Skellington had about 800 faces that were hand sculpted. A lead character on a, a Leica film has over a million different possible facial expressions. So the act of taking this 3D printing technology and harnessing it with the computer, we're able to bring the subtlety and expressivity to uh, stop motion characters that we've never seen before in the medium. And I got one final film, uh, the two more films that are gonna need sound. Mmm, <coughs> must have died down, suddenly. And then last but not least, I don't need the mic for this, but so I have a, a short little video to sort of show you guys everything that 3D printing has gone into over the years at Leica. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. Uh, this is the film that Leica is actively filming now. We're about 10 months into production. It's called Kubo and the Two Strings. It'll come out sometime in 2016.
Thank you guys very much again for your time. Uh, I'll be, I'm going to move the puppets outside and be out there for about 15, 20 minutes if you guys have other questions. Thanks. Thank you.